Good morning and welcome everybody to Schwab Coaching for our Monday edition of Trader Talk in today's market. I am your host, Kevin Horner, joining you from a sunny and beautiful Denver, Colorado. Today, I am joined once again by my friend and Schwab coach, Jeffrey Avalos, though it's been a little bit. Hey, Jeff, great to see you. How are you? I am wonderful. So great to be here with you today. Congratulations on the sunny day in Denver. I am in the very beautiful but a little hot Phoenix, Arizona, where the sun is shining. But it's it's probably a little bit warmer, I would imagine. Yeah, probably. Uh, we we hit into the uh, the upper 80s this weekend. It was great until late yesterday. We got hammered with a bunch of rain and hail. But nonetheless, a good Ooh. weekend on my end of things. I, uh, I'm pleased to be here, though, ready to get down to business with all of you. Happy that we've got Connie Hill in chat with us today, everybody. You feel free to reach out and engage with us in the chat function there. Connie will keep an eye on things, and, and Jeff and I will also do the same, uh, try to get to a number of your questions and comments in there as we work through our discussion today. Please feel free uh, to engage with us there. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, remember, follow us on X. Now, Jeff was not is not yet there, but Connie <laughs> and I are. So you can follow us on X at Kevin Horner CS, at Connie Hill CS. And if you like our content here this morning, we'd love that thumbs up button to be smashed. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to our Schwab Coaching channel. Now, before we move into that discussion, I do want to remind you a couple of key components. Number one, our discussion is exclusively informational and educational. Remember, we do not make recommendations, so expressions of opinion are always subject to change without notice. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. We're going to talk technical analysis, as we often do. Uh, in doing so, it's important to remember that technical analysis should be considered a complementary viewpoint to your fundamental research. Additionally, the extent to which we get into options today, you'll want to remember that options do require uh, a higher level of or do come with a higher level of risk. They're not appropriate for all investors. You'll want to make sure to familiarize yourself with the characteristics and risks of standardized options. And you do need to be previously approved before being able to trade those in your Schwab account. So make sure you go through the requisite steps there. Now, in our show, we get started with a broad market look at things. So we're going to hit up the major indices. We'll look at the S&P 500. We're going to look at the NASDAQ 100 along with the Russell, perhaps a few of the um, extended groups there as well before looking at some individual equities for you today, some stocks in the news. And we do intend to round it out today with a new trade in our example portfolio. So an example trade in the example portfolio and in the final 10 to 15 minutes or so. So we'll see how that shakes out. Uh, with that, Jeff, we're going to kick off, as I noted, with the S&P 500, the SPX. Now, Jeff, we got a little bit of red on our screen as we get started. A quick zoom into what's going on here, though. Visually, talk to me about what you see out of this market here, about the, the action of the last, say, say, four sessions or so, notably. Yeah. Well, well really good call-outs that you have. So the first thing that, that captures my attention is I'm looking at the 20, the 50, and the 200-day simple moving average. One of the things that if you're bullish, you want to see, a lot of you already know this, but let's reiterate, you want to see the 20 above the 50, 50 above the 200, and then the equity itself, or in this case, the index above all of those, which is what we're seeing. So you've already got some bullish movement right there. But the thing I think that a lot of traders are looking at, Kevin, is you notice that, let's call it back in late March, we hit a resistance, came back down. But then in late May, we beat past that resistance, going just a little bit higher, pulling back to that resistance level. And then now, just these last Friday and Thursday, got past that resistance level. So what are we doing? We are hitting higher highs. Again, for the people out there who are bullish, this is ideally what you would want to see in the market if you are thinking about taking a new position where you've come up, hit a resistance, started to pull back. Maybe I start to grab a little bit in the hopes that it'll continue moving further north. So that's what's capturing my attention just on a real quick look. I'm always curious, though, what are some of your insights? Well, I, I'd be hard pressed to, to disagree. Let's try and define uh, what we mean, though, when you say uh, that we've got obviously we've got new highs made just on Friday, a new intraday high, that 53.75 note up here. But we're talking about that. Your commentary leads into the very short term side of things. Right. And, and obviously we say that because 
what's happened in the last four days, making a new high after a test of that uh, ever important 50 day moving average with one of those lengthy tails at the bottom telling us there was a bit of a sentiment shift when we got price action as low as 5,200 approximately, we saw buyers step in. So that told us something. And so we look at that in a short term basis and say, sure, that certainly it makes sense. Now, if you're a longer term investor, you might be saying, well, you know, I'm comfortable because we've maintained this level for a while, but you also might be uncomfortable because we have maintained this level and could very easily be due for a pullback uh, that even if it is uh, a limited amount, Jeff, I mean, a uh, 3% pullback would be greater than 150 SPX points. So not everybody's going to be comfortable with that, even if they're thinking long run. My hope would be a long-term trader, Jeff, would look at a 3 to 5% pullback as no big deal in the grand scheme of things. But I think it's important that we always consider multiple time frames when we're looking at this. Yeah, um, I really agree. The, you know, the other thing that I wanted to call out just briefly is that we do have a slight divergence here in the RSI. You'll note we made a high when we made the high last week or two weeks back, three weeks back or so. And then now we made that new intraday high. And we did not get a higher high in the RSI. So it could just be weakening its current trend. But Jeff, we could work that out through consolidation uh, and simply going sideways or kind of meandering, if you will, for a period yeah. of time as well. Also, not uncommon, too, to see a pullback in volume during the summer months. It's actually mm -hmm. quite natural for us to see less volume during the six months that have the summer involved versus the six months that have the winter involved. So. I would say I'm not um, I, I'm not talking to a lot of traders right now that are concerned about that RSI just yet. However, if we do hit another high and that RSI again fails to find itself coming up to that 70 line or even beating past this this high that we hit last uh, Wednesday and Thursday, mm -hmm. then you might start to see a little bit of concern coming from some of those technical traders out there. Sure. Yeah. And, and again, it's good to have these thoughts kind of laid out. Uh, but what we don't probably want to do is utilize things that are, um, uh, you know, tertiary like the RSI or even on balance volume, any of these indicators that we might lean into. We don't want to use them too much from a predictive nature, right? We don't believe that they predict what's happening, but they can confirm it. So maybe giving this a little time to play out uh, and not stepping into uh, positions that would be bearish in nature, for example, before bearish activity really comes into play. I think that's one of the hardest things, Jeff, is uh, you're, you're a bull by nature. You're watching the market continue to trudge higher. Uh, it's, it's just climbing and not giving you many pullbacks. So when you, when you feel like things are a little overdone, human nature leads you to say, well, maybe this is the moment that's going to turn. Maybe I should be looking bearishly. And, and it could go that way. But a lot of traders tend to wait for those things to start to fall before they really take those bear positions, Jeff. There's a way to manage your long side stuff, your bullish stuff, without going uh, bearishly into the next step, right? You can yeah. manage your long positions a little more easily just by, in many cases, just moving into cash or reducing position size, couldn't you? Yeah, nothing wrong with taking profits too as you start to hit some of these levels. And I love that too. Remember, the trend is your friend. Right now, it's very hard to say that this is a bearish trend. So if you're somebody that's in the bullish camp, maybe you've already got your positions, probably just like Kevin had pointed out, might not yet be the time to start throwing on a bunch of bearish positions unless you're somebody that says, hey, I think now is when the market top starts to happen. In that case, there's nothing wrong with that. Maybe you just want to tighten up those stops a little bit as things continue to creep higher potentially. Yeah, very, very well said here, Jeff. Now, what's going on with the NASDAQ looks awfully similar. I'll zoom in. Uh, we'll see that we've made a fantastic 52-week move here, lows to highs, uh, adding about 5,000 NDX points. And it seems to me to be a bit of a bull flag up here, even though, once again, we can make note of a very, very minor uh, divergence here in the RSI as well. Love that. So talk to me about that. And this is why I love coming on your show, Kevin, because – I'm always capturing new things by way of your insight. So you mentioned the bull flag and I immediately go, oh my gosh, he's absolutely right. But for the viewers out there, maybe those new to technical analysis, what exactly is a, a bull flag? What are you looking at and what could it possibly mean? Well, if I zoom in here a little bit, 
what we are looking at is really just the extended move. Some traders will look at just the most recent green two candles in here from last week as the flag <laughs> pole. And then we are in the midst of creating a little what we call the cloth portion of that flag. Uh, some other traders will go back to the actual move we made last week when, again, sentiment shifted, Jeff. I've got that arrow drawn in. In fact, I'm going to make that a different color because I don't think that stands out as well. Here, let's make this some kind of uh, – there we go. So that arrow stands out now, right? This yeah. candle was the same day we had that big, beautiful green engulfing candle on the SPX. But this one is red because we closed above our or below our open that day. However, the tail length is significant. So some traders would say that this rally began with the low here. And they might just look at it like this. So let me uh, see if I can draw this in. So here's your kind of your flag. You might even take it all the way to the intraperiod high. Okay. But ultimately, what we're looking at is just this little consolidation. And that's all this is, everybody. Very limited bit of selling, Jeff. Uh, you could look at this a couple of ways, obviously. One is that we've got uh, the opportunity to maybe take this down to, you know, that prior high, which is essentially about where today's lows are, right? That mm -hmm. intraperiod high. Jeff, if that occurred, some traders would tell you that's a very strong bull flag simply because the drawdown off the peaks has been very tight. So the tighter that the drawdown is, perhaps the opportunity becomes more bullish for the short-term trader. But as you often say, we would often say, Jeff, some traders are looking for confirmation, right? And they want to see us take out the most recent highs to really validate that potential bull flag. Uh, and the reminder, I think, here is what bull flags represent, Jeff. They are continuation patterns in the midst of a strong uptrend. We are in the midst of a strong uptrend as it relates to the NDX. And in the last week and a half, two weeks, we've got a slight uptrend that's working strongly yet. So tough to look at this as anything other than bullish as well, isn't it? Sure. Yeah. Well, you know what? I really like that you pointed out because I used to get questions about this a lot, and I still do every now and then. But I have some clients reach out to me. They go, why do people use buy stops? Why would I buy something at a higher price? That doesn't make sense. And what Kevin just pointed out there to the viewers, I hope you all capture that. The buy stop is something that you utilize that says, well, right now I need it to break past a potential resistance. So that high point of 1911.3, that's kind of your resistance right now. Where would your buy stop be? It would be just above that. So you're thinking mm -hmm. if we can break past that old resistance level, now we have a new trend forming. Now I am interested in taking on that position. So for those of you out there who are, are having that question float around in your noodles, how the heck do you take a buy stop? Why would I ever want to buy higher? That's the reason. Yep. I'll tell you what, if you're a momentum trader, Jeff, buy stops probably should be part of your vocabulary, at Great least in terms out. of um, taking opportunities that are presented. We know that breakouts don't always hold. Sometimes we get a breakout that turns into a fake out uh, and we get thrown right back into the prior level of price action. Uh, they're not always going to work. But one of the reasons that uh, that traders will employ that buy stop is the belief that you get through a certain price level and it takes off the the resistance, right? Or essentially, there's not enough uh, selling pressure at those price levels to keep price tamped down, and therefore price continues to rise. Um, now, the expectation thereafter is frequently, hey, we get a breakout. We see price action bring you right back to the breakout in the coming days or weeks thereafter. We call those confirmation or retests of our breakout levels. And Jeff, those can be really great and re-strengthen the trend, but we don't know how long it's going to go. And we don't even know if the retest is actually going to come. So that's, one again, one of the reasons traders like the idea of potentially considering these um, breakout plays and buy stop orders. Question for you, Kevin. So. What if, what if somebody's noticing, hey, the market keeps going up, should I be concerned that the higher it goes, should I be more and more worried that, that it, there's an inevitable pullback? What are, what are some of your thoughts? Well, I try not to worry about things that I have no control over. Um, I'm not very good at it, but <laughs> um, the truth of the matter is the market can always, the market's going to do what the market's going to do. And remember, the market is always right. We might not be managing it right, but the market is always right. So one of the things that some traders do, Jeff, when they start getting into these levels where they're getting uncomfortable, if, first of all, we should note, 
it's great to be uncomfortable because the market continues to climb, right? Mm, oh, yeah, my positions are growing and my my uh, profit scenario is much larger than it had been. And the reason I'm nervous at that point is, oh, no, I don't want to give back those profits. I'd understand that. Uh, so traders will do a number of things. They'll consider raising their stop orders to in an effort to lock in some of those gains. Right. We know that stop orders don't guarantee price. We remind you every time. So remember, you utilize a stop. It's a trigger price. And then once triggered, it becomes a market order. So you can gain execution at any price other than your trigger. You got to be aware of that. That said, Jeff, I think employing tighter stops is one option, as is the ability to simply generate more cash just by taking profits. Right. It's one thing to employ a stop. It's another just to say I've made enough or I've done really well. If I sold off half of this position right now, I'll tell you what, if anything did happen, I'd feel a lot better. Gotcha. Cool. Great insights. So, and also, too, uh, I know people are probably asking, what about the jobs numbers? We heard about the jobs numbers last yeah. Friday. What, what exactly does that mean? Well, they were more robust than people were anticipating. That probably means that the Fed is not going to be increasing interest rates or, excuse me, decreasing interest rates in July possibly look for them to doing something in September. Now, of course, we don't know what the Fed's going to do. The Fed probably doesn't yet know what they're going to do. But that's something that you may want to keep your eyes out for. You have more commentary, by the way, in the Schwab Center for Financial Research. If you go under schwab.com, the Learn tab is where you get that. Yeah, there, and there's going to be some discussion on that. Jeff, I think last week's move was um, and <clears throat> granted, I, I'm not going to be uh, great to speak to the discrepancies in numbers. You know what we got on Wednesday, Jolt's report, for example, versus Friday's jobs number. But I think what we learned was, like you said, not likely to see a rate increase anytime soon. Uh, when I'm looking at it this week, by the way, we're going to be hearing from the Fed on Wednesday. There is a decision, and the likelihood is that there's no change. Okay, We say that's the likelihood, but we don't know. That's currently how traders are positioned in the futures markets relative to the, to the rate situation. So likelihood is we stay at 525 to 550 on Wednesday. Uh, we move into July. Jeff, it's still a very high likelihood of maintaining the status quo into July's report. And only, as you just stated, into September does things get a, do things get a little bit unsure, right? 50-50 uh, almost for a shift and 50-50 on status quo. So again, keep an eye on this. Um, it, you know, we, we don't we can't use this as predictive, but remember what this implies. This is just simply stating where traders are currently positioned relative to the potential for a rate change. Yeah. Good now, job. Jeff, let's go back and we utilize the rate change conversation to jump into the Russell. Uh, the Russell has slipped pretty significantly yeah. today. Um, and I say significantly because of the level we just took out. What are your thoughts on what's going on here? Well, when I look at the Russell, one of the things that jumps out to me is this was a very different conversation in the first, let's say, quarter of the year. Everybody remember that? Yeah. The Russell was running up. We were starting to see extra market breadth, which is what you want to see in a bullish market. Things were moving to the positive. And so there was a lot of euphoria starting to come into the market because you were not only getting the big tech companies pulling the market higher, you were also having some help from the smaller cap companies here in the Russell. Now, as we get into these summer months, you're starting to see a pullback. And you notice we hit that high in about early to mid-March. And then we tried it again in, in May, but unlike with the S&P and the NASDAQ, we had a failure to break past that level. Now we're going even lower. You've got the, the index below the 20 and the 50. The 20 just started turning negative, which is a little bit of a concern if you're on the bullish side. So Kevin, one of the things that I'm starting to take a look at with clients is how is your portfolio positioned in relation to the aggressive nature? And what I mean by that is, do you feel like you now have too much exposure to the smaller cap companies? The market has been on a great run. If you're thinking, you know what, we're due for a pullback and I'm starting to see a little bit of concern because the Russell is not following the S&P 500 higher, what are you maybe doing? Well, Kevin talked about doing stops. Perhaps what you start to do is lighten up on the small cap positions that you have and start to go a little bit heavier on the larger caps or grab yourself some dry powders. Kevin talked about before, 
putting stuff into cash if you're thinking a pullback is coming in the overall market not a bad idea either but this is a little bit of concerning i wouldn't say kevin that it's a canary in the coal mine but not seeing the market breadth on the small caps that we're seeing in the large caps does give traders a little bit of trepidation. What are some of your thoughts, big guy? Yeah, no, that that stands out to me as well. Uh, and and in, of course, we have no choice. We got to we, if we're looking at the Russell, we got to look at the Russell relative to rates, right? We were just talking about the potential for rates staying the status quo. And when we saw the ten year here get a rally on Friday's jobs number, it was because of the so-called robust or strength in the jobs market that led to some, or excuse me, the um, uh, a little more weakness in the jobs market, excuse me, that led to selling of treasury notes, and hence we get a rally in yields, Jeff. So yield yeah. rallies, it's proven to be difficult uh, outside of a few instances in the most recent couple of months where there's been a little bit of a bifurcation with that normalcy, right? Normally we see 10-year yield rising that puts pressure on the Russell. That's kind of what we're getting today. Uh, but there's been a little bit of a few instances where that's been a little different uh, of late. But I think that bears watching. Um, you know, last week we touched on the level that we got down to 4.3. And that's exactly what we bounced off, Jeff. So right now, that looks like support for the yield. And if that's the case, what you got out of the Russell's move today, a gap through a, uh, excuse me, a gap through the gap, essentially, right? Uh, which may very well imply additional weakness. This rectangle I drew in was kind of the last zone of short-term support, Jeff. So if it doesn't get into that rectangle immediately, like tomorrow, if not today, uh, then the Russell could easily see some slippage into the 200-day moving average down here in, in blue. I think yeah. that's what short-term traders may be keeping an eye on right now. Such a good call. And every time... You're looking at a chart too. A lot of the viewers and traders out there know this. It's natural to see, wait a second, our previous support level also happens to coincide with where the 200 period simple moving average is. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> like Kevin mentioned before, try not to get ahead of the trade, but don't be surprised if that's exactly what transpires. And who knows how long it might take? Who knows if it ever happens? But certainly, if we are seeing it on the show today, that is definitely something that other traders are taking a look at throughout the week. Yep, that's a great way of stating it, um, mainly because we that's what technical analysis is. Remember, there's a big portion of technical analysis that is so-called self-fulfillment, and that self-fulfillment just stems from the fact that many, many traders rely on a lot of the same concepts and strategies in looking at the broad market. So uh, some notes in the queue here. One, take advantage of that survey for us, everybody. I hope you know that we pay close attention to your survey commentary. Uh, you don't need to do it mid-show. Just hit that link, though. It'll open a browser window for you in the same window here, uh, and that, then it'll be ready for you post-show. We'd love your input. I try to take that to heart and bring that to the next segments so that we can uh, continue to expand our learnings for all of you. So please take advantage of that. Uh, then there's a good question about the length of the, sh the shortest moving average length you might consider. I always like this question, Jeff, because it reminds us that as traders, we're all quite different. Yes, on our standard chart here, 20-day, 50-day, 200-day moving average. But Jeff, I liken this uh, as I often do to my golf bag, not a great golfer, <laughs> but I love to be out there. Uh, uh -huh. But the truth is, <clears throat> I'm, you know, chances are I'm not going to use every club in my bag every time I'm out. If I'm having a good round, hope chances are I'm not going to need that sand wedge. But when I get into the sand, I'm going to need a sand wedge. So I liken all of our time frames, for, even for moving averages, to the type of trade we're using. And so we go back, Jeff, briefly to the concept of a breakout trade, you know what? Some traders will use a very short-term moving average, maybe a 10, maybe even a five-day if it appears valid on a potential breakout trade. But how do you look at those things? I think in just the very same manner. If I'm doing a, <clears throat> excuse me, a shorter-term trade, I'm going to use shorter-term moving averages. But one of the things, too, also you probably want to be aware of if you're a trader and, and to the viewers out there, the simple moving averages tend to coincide more with the support and resistance levels that we see, while the exponential moving averages, those that give more weight to the most recent time period, are things that are indicators of possibly getting in a little early or getting out a little bit early. So I'm also going to play around not just with the time frame going potentially down to a three or a five period, but there's also going to be the element of should I be looking at simple moving averages or at exponential mm -hmm. moving averages. Something like this where the market is being broken down on a very wide breadth 
you're probably going to see more traders relying on the simple moving averages. But if you're talking to a day trader and they're saying, I'm getting in and out looking for pennies, they might be relying a little bit more on the exponential moving averages. So it's not just the time period, but it's also the weighting that we give to each of those periods. Great point. Great point. I do know some traders, by the way, who uh, incorporate simple moving averages on their daily and weekly charts, but on the intra period, the speedier windows, five minute bar charts, hour long bar charts, they might incorporate exponential moving averages because, as you said, they carry more weight in the shorter term so they can give you signals a little bit earlier. That said, Jeff, one of the things about technical analysis is, of course, the fact that when you work with a smaller time frame or a shorter time frame, your risk is greater because it's a less reliable trend analysis. So a lot of everything things. has a balance, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And, and as soon as you find out the perfect way to read the market, I would almost guarantee it's going to change. You're going to have to adapt. So the more we learn, the less we know, which is always great about finance. I agree. Okay. We got to answer another good question in the queue because I can't help but uh, agree. It is absolutely, there's a connection here. It's from James asking about the movement in gold we got Friday. So as we were talking about the yield move, again, it was a weaker jobs number, implication being weaker economy. Therefore, yields rise because sentiment of uh, bond or note buyers is weak. They're selling notes saying, okay, we have less confidence in the U.S. economy. And then we sold, saw that uh, gold got sold down as well. So take a look at gold. Big, ugly candlestick on Friday, but right to a major ledge of support right around 2300. Now, we can say that Friday's candle is tied directly to that jobs number and the uh, and the uh, supposed weakness we see in the economy currently, Jeff. Um, it's not just gold, though. OK, so that came down to a pretty important level. But I think it's also notable. We can take a look at uh, copper, which is a yeah. pretty decent indication of eco economic health, both yes. in the U.S. as well as internationally or worldwide. It's been on a little bit of a drawdown. And that candle on Friday was also significant, wasn't it? Yeah, that's the I think the copper one is the one that a lot of traders and, and economists are probably going to be leaning to, because just like you said, Kevin, that's going to be more indicative of the overall economy. Gold, you see that in a few products here and there, a couple of electronics, but copper is very, very common in industrial production. When you have a movement like this, that is definitely something that a lot of traders are taking note of. So for those of you out there that are trying to say, well, I'd like something for the bear argument, excellent example right here with copper, pulling back from that 5.2 level now down to about 4.4, 4.5 or so. This is something that I think traders are going to be keeping an eye on over the next couple of weeks and maybe paying a closer attention to it because you see it breaking past that 20, took a beat pause there, broke down down below the 50, coming back up. If you can't get that copper above that 50 period moving average, that could start to permeate in the overall sentiment of the market. And you may see some weakness, whether the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ pulls back. Who knows what's going to happen there? But I would have a very tough time finding an argument for why the market is going to continue going higher with the divergence as copper goes lower. What do you think, I, Kevin? That that could be a problem or it could be a bit of a headwind. Would, mm -hmm. would not discourage that viewpoint or disagree with it. Um, some questions about whether this looks a little head and shoulder topish. Uh, it's a possibility, sure. I mean, uh, if I was to put a little line here at the left shoulder, uh, I could put a line over here at the right shoulder, and then we could suggest that all of the action up here is the head. That's certainly a possibility. And if that is valid, Jeff, then some would tell you that the break we made on Friday took us through the potential neckline. Yeah. That means that we are at an important spot, and you need to see copper get a bounce here because if it's on the neckline and it breaks down any further, then uh, that, that is some risk. I mean, somewhere in the level of about 70 cents a unit here, uh, in this case, would take you down to, what, about 380, uh, which cool. would actually break the 200-day moving average if that were the case, Jeff. So, And then I say that, I'm, I'm giving that based on a measured move potential. Remember, measured moves are not guaranteed, everybody. These are just potential situations that could play out. But, um, yeah, if, if today's level bounce doesn't hold or if we only rally halfway up the candle into the 50-day moving average, that could be a little bit of a heads up as well. Yeah, good call out, by the way, to the viewers. Good catch right there. I love our viewers. We just have yeah, some of the well. most intelligent individuals. Yeah, on point. Um, put up the Bollinger Bands here real quickly to see. I mean, there are certainly, oh, let's see, I've got it added over here. Uh, we might be at the 
bottom of the Bollinger Bands, and some traders might suggest that when you're sitting at the bottom that there's an opportunity. But Mr. Bollinger himself has stated a number of occasions that you know testing the bottom band, testing the upper band, these are not by themselves signals to go long, signals to go short. Um, so just bear that in mind. But we are at the, the lower end of the band. You can see we ran the band to the upside here for quite a while, Jeff. So yeah. keep that in mind because – just because we had run it to the upside on the um, on the uptrend doesn't mean we couldn't do the exact same thing on the downside. Certainly well a possibility. Said. Absolutely. Um, okay, Jeff, we got some other stocks in the news that we needed to get to today. I want to make Ooh. sure that we hit up a few of those. A few names that you all are familiar with. We did have the NVIDIA split occur over the weekend. So let's take a peek at where NVIDIA is trading here. I'm going to go back to our standard study set here, 2050, 200 RSI on balance volume. Um just a reminder that your pattern is going to look very much the same. Um, your positions should all be, I would imagine, are updated already, maybe uh, maybe by the end of the day. But, Jeff, there's not a lot to say here other than the 20-day moving average seems to be too slow for NVIDIA. Uh, what are you thinking? <laughs> Trying its best to catch up. Well, the yes. thing with NVIDIA, too, and, and we talk about this frequently, the news trumps all. And if you notice, news trumps all, news beats all, news news whips all, whatever you want to call it. The thing that you're looking at with NVIDIA is you've got this sentiment that just continues to go higher and higher and higher. But it's been like this for the last, what, six, seven quarters where NVIDIA is going higher, but then their earnings are also keeping up with it. So with regard to NVIDIA, sure, you're going to get some noise in between your earnings announcements, but ultimately, I believe it's going to be those earnings announcements that traders keep their eyes on. I get this question from clients all the time. Well, this feels a lot like the 2000s, the dot-com bubble. Is, is that what's going on? I have no idea whether a bubble is forming or not, but what I can share with you is that you did not have the same P.E., in the 2000s that you do right now with something like NVIDIA. NVIDIA is actually quite normal for a growth tech company. Going back to the 2000s, the NASDAQ PE was 200. 200, <laughs> and yeah, that's a little bit of a red flag moment. But looking at what we're seeing with NVIDIA right here, I would imagine as long as they continue to hit those earnings, they will continue to move higher, Kevin. What are your thoughts? Well, I just am going to say the same thing as a uh, use this as a case study. We were talking just a minute ago about moving averages and the proper ones to use. Um, I don't know if everybody noticed it, but as you were chatting, I moved my 20 period moving average to a 10 period moving average. I did that by going into the beaker and changing it right here. It was 20. Now it's 10. Well, why is that pertinent? Well, Jeff, we've been above the 10 all the way back to April 26. Now, we've tested it a number of times, getting below it quickly or coming close to it, but not breaking it. So this could work for some short-term traders. Remember, you can be a seller on strength. You can be a seller on weakness. Trader who wants to sell on weakness might consider reducing position size in NVIDIA under the 10-day moving average. Today, that level um, – let me expand this for you. Today, that level is a 116.32, okay, the equivalent of 1163. So just keep yourselves in mind there. If you're if you're a short termer, that's how some traders might manage that. Um, you know, a close below the 10 day would be a heads up because it'd be the first since April 26, which means we had all of May and thus far in June, basically the last five and a half six weeks holding the 10 day moving average. So we'll see if that matters in the short run. But I like what you said, Jeff. News can trump everything else, right? Um, mm -hmm. Trend analysis is is taking all of that news into account. I think the reminder we need to put in our heads is what we see in the chart is tied directly to all known information. The straight, the likelihood is very high, Jeff, that you nor I nor anyone else out there necessarily knows anything about Nvidia in this case that that the rest of the market doesn't. So that's right. why we believe in price, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we had um, other news. We had JP Morgan upgrading Walmart today, went to overweight from neutral, put a target at 81, a significant bump here, Jeff, from 66. Analysts believing the stock adds a strong balance of defense and offense uh, in a softening consumer backdrop. So the point here was one of uh, maybe providing a long-term portfolio, some stability is based on how I read that. What about you? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. The, when you're looking at what's happening with costs out there, a lot of us know our pocketbooks have been hit by the rising increase in groceries. People are looking to a Walmart, to an Aldi, to an Amazon as a way of getting a little bit of relief on those prices. So I'm not surprised that the analysts at JP Morgan thought that now might be a time to upgrade this to a buy from a neutral. So, and, and yeah, and you've got a stock that's just broken out. And like you said, in the last two weeks here, um, not a shock, right? It'd been great. great. Analysts came back in this window and said, hey, uh, while this is in the midst of consolidating, we really love uh, Walmart. That's unfortunately not the way that analysts <laughs> necessarily work. But uh, we got a, a breakout and a rally. Uh, we we got a gap move and it has not given you a lower level since. So yesterday, uh, Friday's candles not inspiring. So that's a, a heads up. But again, under the 10 day moving average here, given the speed, uh, some traders are apt to stick with a position perhaps until that changes. I'm going back to my standard stuff here. You certainly could use a 20 as well, you know, about a couple bucks away. Um, Jeff, I, ha I have you on the show. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that oh, uh, Truist go. upgraded Krispy Kreme donuts. Now, how about you that? Missed. You missed, you weren't here for our donut day, but uh, National Donut Day last week. Uh, yeah. But here we have Krispy Kreme getting an upgrade from Truist to buy from old. Target at 15, prior target at 13. Take a look. Uh, 13 was is pretty close to the 200-day moving average, basically. And uh, the, so that's a that's nice. But they said 15, which would take you up uh, into where the, um, you know, the consolidation we fell from last time. So. That's an interesting, but Jeff, that's not a real great looking chart here. Yeah, well, I mean, you really are looking for like, like I'm looking for a bottom feeding, something that's been beaten up and I want to try to get into it. By the way, shout out to National Donut Day. Love the Salvation <laughs> Army and the story behind that. It's easily my favorite day in June. But when you're looking at something like this, so you notice it's up about 5%. The idea with these upgrades on an otherwise beaten down company is, you're trying to say, this is the time where I need to reallocate and get part of my portfolio into a company like a Krispy Kreme. I need more exposure to some of the seasonalities of the food market. So when you're doing your trading, there is that notion that we talked about, news beats all. There's also the idea that, well, you know what? I could trickle into a trade as well. So something like this, not a great looking trade. Sure, now we're up at our 20 period simple moving average, but oh boy, there's a lot of upward resistance from a lot of trading perspectives. Maybe what you start to do is say, if I wanted to take a position on something like a Krispy Kreme or any company that's been upgraded after being beaten up a little bit, maybe you start to trickle in. Figure out what 100% of your position is going to be and buy 10% of it. Wait a couple of days, see what happens. Buy another 10% of it. This does not have to be an all or none game. No, it doesn't. Great reminder. Um, our, our viewers know that I speak heavily on the idea of piecing in do a trade, piecing out of the trade, having a plan and attacking it that way. I find that to be a good way to manage one's emotional tie to their trade and to their money uh, by just doing a little at a time. It can really give you the, the comfort to say, hey, I'm participating, but things aren't going the way I like. So I'm going to take my loss. But your loss is a lot less than what it ultimately would have been if you took a full position. Uh, Jeff, there's a great question in the queue about use of the OBV or on balance volume, which I have in my volume pane. Uh, that's the white line that meanders through our vertical bars in uh, traditionally green or red. But um, Jeff, again, we speak about things like this all the time. But can you remind our viewers uh, the general thought process as, as it relates to on balance volume and, you know, the uh, the reminder again? Tertiary details like this are all looking at really the same stuff. They're not necessarily predictive. No, well, you know what? To tell you the truth, Kevin, I would actually, I'm going to throw it back to you. I don't utilize the on balance volume. It's been, yeah, it's been a number of years probably since I've incorporated an OBV. I don't get a lot of questions from clients about that. So this is one area where I just don't I seem do. to have the expertise. But yeah, Kevin, I know you know this one. What What is the on balance volume? And I'm going to start taking some notes. Let's watch. OK, so the big thing I'd say is the action since the breakout, right? We had this excellent pop 
uh, you know, middle of uh, late March. I don't even know what led to this, Jeff. You might, mm-hmm. since you're so uh, in tune with the world <laughs> of donuts. Uh, but what's <laughs> happened since has been that volume has been largely to the downside. So what does on balance volume represent? It is simply a calculation that adds volume on up days and reduces volume on down days, literally doll- uh, share for share. So when you have an up day, all of that volume on the up day is applied on the plus side and all the volume on down days is applied to the downside. And so what you get out of something like this says that the downtrend is being confirmed. So much like uh, RSI, which down below is saying, hey, we got into oversold conditions under the 30 level when we made our last low, the on balance volume made a new low at that same time, confirming the downtrend. As such, Jeff, someone might look at this downtrend and point out, hey, each of the last couple times we've rallied into the 20-day moving average, it has been a pullback thereafter. Is this a pullback as well or potentially a bearish setup, or is it possible that today's news trumps that setup? Mm -hmm. Certainly a possibility, right? Yeah. And uh, for the viewers out there, of course, I know what that was. That was when McDonald's announced they were going to start carrying Krispy Kremes. Well, there uh, you go. I knew you would, I knew you would know that. Top, right? Yeah. So a question for you then. So when we're looking at the on balance volume and, and we look at the volume itself underneath that, what if we mm-hmm. see the on balance volume is, is starting to increase, but mm-hmm. we're getting more uh, red days? Is that possible? Could that happen? And, and if so, how do we read that? Well, then that, that's kind of the tricky thing, right? You wouldn't want necessarily to look at the raw volume bars. You want to lean in thereafter to the the actual line. What you're looking okay. for is kind of a heads up that maybe what's going on in the interim is a, a accumulation of volume, which could lead to a breakout in some way. So it's possible that you could be seeing that, but I don't think you're getting it on this chart. If we went over to Walmart once more, though, and we're to look back, let's just do this. I'm going to move our chart, and let's just go back to right here before the breakout. Now, granted, we had an opportunity for the breakout, but what we're looking at is how is the white line maintaining the trend as we went sideways in price? And you'll notice this was all kind of holding on, right? It was giving you um, the same level in price. The OBV line down here wasn't breaking down. In fact, there was a period where it started to break out a little bit. Now, in these consolidations, you might want to see, yes, if we could get that line rising a little more quickly, then we might have some heads up or something. But the truth is, this OBV line, Jeff, really held up quite well. And that might have given traders confidence to stick with their Walmart position, even though we were just meandering sideways. Of Gosh. course, we had an earnings that was as big an impact on that move as anything. That yeah. said, um, you know, that's how some traders may look at that. I thought, um, Jeff, I wanted to, I mean, we only have a couple of minutes here, but sure. if we go back to the deep, to the Krispy Kreme, um, yeah. you know, one of the things that we could look at is how to, how to consider taking a position in a stock where you're not convinced it's entirely ready to go, but you okay. want to take a position because, A, either you like the stock, um, but you wouldn't mind it getting it at a lower price. Meaning, Jeff, we could put a limit order down there at 10 bucks, right? Okay. Say, hey, if it drops a buck, a buck 15, I'd love to buy it. Um, mm-hmm. But alternatively, if you're bullish, you could just own it right now, but you're putting money on the table. Mm -hmm. Uh, An option trader might buy a long call, except that they are putting money on the table. And if you buy a long option, your risk is the amount you paid for it. But not everybody's going to be comfortable with that, Jeff. So just one consideration here. What about the alternative bullish strategy of perhaps selling a put contract? Yeah. Well, I think a lot of traders out there have started to get more involved in the selling of the put, essentially getting paid to buy it at a lower price. And what you're doing is you're saying, if this goes down to $10, force me to buy it. I was going to buy it there anyway. I was going to put in a limit order. But by selling a put contract, you're, you're kind of becoming somebody else's floor. If it drops below $10, they're going to say, hey, here you go. This, here's your shares. Take them from me at $10. But in this case, Kevin, I love what your call out is you're not having to outlay any money. And in fact, you're getting paid. 
to take yep. on this new position. So what would that look like if we were to do something like this? Well, the unfortunate thing is, given our price ranges, we're right in the middle. You, you could look at selling a $10 put. You're only mm -hmm. going to bring in $5. That's not going to be very helpful to your bottom line. Yeah. Um, you could look at the 1250 put, but that's in the money. So unfortunately, right. just as a look here, when I'm looking for a, what many traders would consider a viable sell puts to open strategy, you either have to go out further in time so that you can get a little bit of a premium uh, or you need to look at a different strategy, unfortunately. If I go further out in time to August, which gives us 67 days, the trader who says, you know what, I'd take 30 or 40 cents. Uh, maybe I do that for a thousand share position, for example, and mm -hmm. they'd sell uh, you know, at 30, 35 cents, you'd bring in $350 on 10 contracts. That might make sense if they wanted to own the stock, but that's the key takeaway, isn't it? If you are the seller, Jeff, of a put, you are entering into a contract to buy at the strike price of the put. Uh, and so you have to not just wonder, uh, want the stock, you have to want the stock at that price as well. And that's yeah. a tough thing for some to consider, but don't, I, I think the takeaway is don't be a seller of stock or uh, puts contracts, Jeff, unless you 100% absolutely are comfortable buying the stock. Because invariably, if you're trading it just for the premium, it's going to, uh, you can almost rest assured you're going to be taking on stock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, another call out too, to the other side. So if let's say, let's say we did sell this put contract and we think, okay, I I'm willing to buy Krispy Kreme at $10. If, and this is 67 days, if it goes below $10, a lot of us would naturally think, oh, great. I'm going to be forced to buy the stock at 10. Not necessarily. Just because it goes what we call in the money, meaning in the case of the puts below yeah. the strike price. That doesn't mean that the buyer is going to force you to buy it. They paid for all that time. They want to get their money's worth. So you could have an instance where it goes below 10, and then before the 67 days is up, goes back above 10, and you actually never get assigned the shares. So if you're going to implement a strategy like this, just be aware if it starts running up, you need to find a point where you say, you know what? This is not going to reside below my $10 strike price. I'm now just going to put in a buy order so I don't miss out on this upward trend. That's Yep. I think it's just a good reminder that there are many ways to be bullish in a situation. Yes, we can own the stock. Yes, we can buy a long call, but you can also consider selling a put. Remember, there's many conversations available for you in the Schwab Coaching Channel, everybody. Uh, be on the lookout for them. Uh, even some getting started with options conversations will delve deeper into that for you. Jeff, we are at time. We're going to have to wrap it up. So thanks for being here. Thanks for talking yeah. donuts with me, buddy. Glad to have <laughs> you back a on pleasure. a Monday here, man. Always so much fun. And thank you very much for the education on the on balance volume. I've got some <laughs> excellent notes. Always a pleasure getting to learn from you, Kevin. Thanks, Jeff. And to all of you, thanks for joining us. Connie Hill in chat. Thanks for managing things for us. Hit that survey for us, everybody. We'd appreciate it. Follow us on X and be sure to subscribe to the YouTube coaching channel. Have a great Monday, everybody. See you again real soon.